Welcome everybody, uh, my name is Mark O'Brien, uh, I'm a researcher based in the Centre for Lifelong Learning. Um, I'll be not doing very much today, just kind of introducing Justin and uh, chairing the Q&A session when Justin's finished presenting. Uh, this is uh, a seminar that's part of the um, series of seminars, continuous series of seminars put on by the Engage Network, uh, which is all about um, practice and methodology and, and impact uh, in research. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I can heartily recommend uh, Justin as a presenter on realist evaluation. He did come in and do a workshop for us in the Centre for Lifelong Learning last year for health practitioners, which I still get nearly a year later the odd email about, you know, is Justin presenting again and can we get his slides and that kind of thing. So, uh, he comes with, comes with a very high recommendation from me. Um, just a, a few words here about Justin. Um, I was reading this out really. Justin is a Senior Research Fellow and Director of the Centre for Advancement in Realist Evaluation and Synthesis here at the University of Liverpool. Previously he held a Canadian Institutes of Health Research Postdoc Fellowship in which he led a large systematic realist synthesis of community-based participatory research. Uh, since 2013 he's been running an intensive annual slate of realist methodology training workshops including an annual summer school at Liverpool as well as two, I know, highly successful international conferences on realist methodology in 2014 and 2016. He's also the co-investigator on the Ramesses II project to develop quality and reporting standards for realist evaluation and, as it says here, is passionate about what realist methodology can offer for research processes and expanding our capacity for, for complexity thinking. Uh, Justin will be presenting for about an hour then we'll have a Q&A &A, Q session. But just in style, I know, is very open. And if you want to jump in with questions or clarifications, uh, don't, you don't have to wait until the end to do that. So just is quite open, I think, it's quite a conversational style uh, where, that's, where, that, where that works. So over to you, okay. Justin. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mark. And thanks to Engage Liverpool for inviting me to, uh, to talk today. Um, so, you know, as Mark said, I'm, I'm very passionate about realist methodology and doing these seminars and workshops, they really have become the highlight of my, you know, career because these are the opportunities to discuss, debate, and engage in um, ideas around methodology, but really to, you know, uh, accomplish some pretty important lines of, of inquiry. So, um, in the next 60 minutes or so, what I'm hoping to do is to you know, impart the basic principle so that you leave here with at least some idea, even if it's just a snippet of an idea of what realist methodology is, to inspire you to go back to the books and read. Because some of the realist methodology texts are not so easily digestible upon first read. So I find that having these seminars where we can really sort of interact with the content, uh, you know, in a more interactive way, um, my hope is that, you know, you can go back and, and do the reading. Uh, I, I do run a summer school, um, and it's four days, and at the end of the summer school, people say that, that even that four days is not enough in terms of what we can accomplish in our understanding. So don't, you know, concern yourself too much if you leave here feeling somewhat, uh, how, you know, if you, if you have questions at the end that, you know, you still need to work through. So I'm going to go through my slides, uh, and then we'll have questions at the end, but do feel free to ask questions for clarification um, as, we, as we proceed, and we can have an ongoing discussion. So just a show of hands, how many people here would say th that they know absolutely nothing about realist methodology? They're just here to learn something. Okay, okay, so about half. How many people here would describe themselves as having some awareness that so you've read some things, you've been following realist methodology, but you're not working on any project. You're just at the contemplation stage too. Okay, that looks like about half. Is there anybody here that is feels like they know, you know, they've, they've got a handle on, on realist methodology and you're working on a project? And yes, one, two, okay. Okay, so hopefully we'll be able to, you know, tend to all these different sort of uh, levels of progress in, in, in understanding um, this, this approach. 
So the first thing I want to point out is that there is something called a realist paradigm, and you might even say there are realist paradigms. And as you see in this um, uh, slide here, that there is a whole tradition, you know, on the left hand of the slide, there's a tradition that is called the philosophy of critical realism. And the main um, sort of progenitor of critical realism is Roy Bhaskar, who wrote books in the 1970s that were um, quite uh, radical in their ideas and created quite a stir. And he developed a following of people who sort of identified themselves as critical realists. And his books were really about developing a realist theory of science and social science. And a lot of that was very much a critique of the mainstream science and also mainstream Western philosophy of science. Uh, and he had colleagues, for example, Margaret Archer, uh, who wrote um, uh, on the realist social theory. So she was very much a social theorist, and, and her work was really um, pinned around the idea of a morphogenetic approach, and she really talks about structure and agency relations from a realist perspective. And there is an interdisciplinary practice of applied critical realism. So there's a, there's a conference that happens uh, once a year, critical realists, and they um, you know, have their own uh, sort of uh, debates and discussions around method and methodology. And then we have Ray Pawson and Nick Tilley's um, realistic evaluation, which is really what I will be talking about today. And in 1997, they wrote a book called Realistic Evaluation. And then in 2006, Ray Pawson wrote a book on realist synthesis. So it's applying the same principles of realist evaluation to literature uh, review. And in 2013, he wrote an updated book on uh, realist evaluation, um, sort of updating his, his, his ideas from the 1997 book. And then we have um, Jeff Wong and colleagues, Trish Greenhouse and other people, and myself included, who have been working on reporting and quality guidelines for realist evaluation and synthesis. And there is an interdisciplinary practice of people who identify themselves as you know, realist researchers. Um, and so what's interesting is that these are sort of fit. These are sort of silos in a sense that there are people, you can go to a critical realism conference and there's some people there who never even heard of realist evaluation, the Pawson and Tilly approach. And there is debate and discussion about what is the relationship between um, these two traditions. And also to mention that Pawson and Tilly were not only influenced by um, realism from the critical realism camp, but there were also other influences uh, on them. And Ray Pawson describes those influences in his 2013 book. In the first chapter, you can, he, he, he talks about all the influences that went into uh, understanding, um, that went into his, his, his understanding of realistic evaluation. So what is realist methodology? Just in a nutshell, we could say that realist methodology is a theory-driven approach to evaluation and synthesis. It is mostly used in the assessment of complex evidence coming from the implementation of policy, programs, services, and interventions. So that's a, a real take-home point that if, say, you are working on a research project where the inquiry is around understanding a policy or an intervention or a service or a program, then you will find that the way the realist uh, methodology is described will fit well with, with your area of inquiry. If you're doing research where there is no intervention that you're studying, so if you're studying the lived experiences of a particular group of people, for example, um, but there's no intervention or program, then it might, you, you will need to adapt the methodology uh, and innovate it. Um, and we are concerned with understanding context and underlying mechanisms of action. So I'm going to be talking about that. In, in detail. So it's really about, you know, the context and mechanism relationship. So just to clarify, um, realist evaluation is for primary analysis. So you, realist evaluation is when you have a project on the ground and you go in and you do primary data collection, 
You could do uh, qualitative interviews, focus group, um, observational uh, field work, um, even surveys, mixed methods approach that's, you know, in line with the realist approach. Um, but it's primary analysis. And realist synthesis is secondary analysis, so that's the literature-based approach. So that's looking at the published literature. You could also look at gray literature. Um, and the more we get into it, the more we find that these two approaches, realist evaluation and realist synthesis, are really quite um, uh, intertwined. They, they're, what, what you find is, what happens is people often do a realist synthesis, but before they do a realist synthesis, they may, they may do a focus group to consult with stakeholders to develop protocol to then do the synthesis. Or alternatively, if you do a realist evaluation, you may go to the literature and see what theories are in the literature before you do your realist evaluation. So it's a real chicken or egg situation. You could do one before the other. There's no set rules of how you do it. It all sort of depends on um, you know, the state of your, of your inquiry and, and what you need. Um, and so here are some general realist principles. So realist methodology was designed for the assessment of program services, interventions, and policy, like I said. Not does it work, or what works on average, but what works for whom, under what circumstances, and how. And this is, this is the, the, become the key tagline of the realist approach. What works for whom, under what circumstances. And then the how one was added later. It was originally what works for whom, under what circumstances. Um, and there is a critique built into the realist approach. If you read Ray Pawson's work, uh, Ray Pawson and Nick Tilley's work, but particularly Ray's work, there is a critique about um, how we do research and what is considered gold standard research, especially in um, health and biomedical sciences, and a critique about research that simply asks the question, does it work? Because in the realist approach, the idea is that a program will work differently in different contexts. So we can never really answer a generalizable question of, Did it, does this work? We have to always see whether this thing will work given co the, the context in which it is being implemented. And this is a, this is a, a challenge and a critique um, for mainstream science where we want to believe that there is generalizable knowledge that can be attained through research process. And once you have that generalizable knowledge, say you did an intervention and you, you did a particular way of, do, of the research where you feel like you have the answer that yes, this intervention works, it's been proven to work, now all we have to do is scale up and roll out across the country or roll up internationally. And if, it's, if there's fidelity to the intervention, then we can expect results. And so the realist approach comes from the sort of opposite end of that, um, idea that there is really not much to say in, in generalizable terms, that we're really interested in the contextual differences and how contexts have an impact on interventions in terms of what they produce. So it's based on a logic of, of, of mixed methods, so mixed methods is very much promoted in realist inquiry, and I'll explain a bit more why that is. And it's evidence theory configuration. So I said the approach is theory driven, but we are also in our, anal in our analytical process in a realist approach. We are incorporating our theories and the evidence together. So we may have micro theories about why things are working. And the reason we incorporate our theory with our evidence is because we are trying to understand things at a very deep level. And at that level, sometimes evidence isn't so readily available. So we need to fill in those evidence gaps with theory in our current project, hoping that we will eventually be able to get evidence um, over time in a, in a cumulative fashion. So it's really evidence theory configurations. It's the idea that interventions do not create change, but people do. So we don't ask the question, did the intervention work? The question we ask is, what resources did that intervention produce and how did people feel about those resources leading to, you know, outcomes of interest? And I'll, I'll ex there's more slides that really sort of get into that. For socially contingent interventions, the mechanism is how people react or respond to resources. This is a very 
central point in the realist approach is that we talk about mechanisms and specifically when we talk about mechanisms for socially contingent interventions. So when I say socially contingent, interventions that rely on our decision making and our feelings um, in order to affect change. So if you think there may be some types of interventions that have no um, need for social agency. But in most research, in most, in, sorry, in most um, interventions, in social interventions, health interventions, there is um, some expectation that, that people will, you know, have, have, have certain types of reactions and feelings to resources um, that the intervention provides, and that forms the basis of how, of how interventions work. And the last point on this slide, program strategy is not synonymous with mechanism. I put that in there because it's a very common mistake that people make when they're doing a realist approach. They think that the strategy offered through the program is the mechanism. The mechanism is actually at a different level um, of reality. So I hope that makes sense, but let, let me move forward because I'll probably be able to clarify that a bit better. So I just have a few slides going to the philosophical basis of realist inquiry, which I always um, include in my presentations because if, you don't, if I don't include this, then at the end of the presentation, there's often some confusion about, well, what is the difference between realist approach and say grounded theory or other forms of qualitative research and it starts to get a bit muddy. But the realist approach has a very distinct philosophical foundation. Right. Now, so this, this, um, this, this, this concept comes from Andrew Sayer's work, who is sort of a critic, you know, in the critical realism community from his book, Realism in the Social Sciences. And what he says is that realism sort of inhabits this middle space between, on the one hand, positivism, and the other hand, constructivism. So, you know, this is very simplified. Obviously, we could have a much more nuanced discussion about this if we had more time. But very simply, if you, you could understand positivism is about theory testing and deductive reasoning, experimental design, quasi-experimental design, randomized controlled trial. Um, and constructivism is about theory building and induction, qualitative design, narrative analysis, interpretation of perspectives. Uh, and probably you've, you've heard of these terms, if not studied them in depth, I'm, I'm assuming. But what you may not have heard of is um, the, the foundation of realism. Uh, there's a key concept in the realist literature called retroduction, which is different from uh, induction and deduction, which I think is you know, useful for us to just think about for a little bit. So what he says is that realism straddles these two um, paradigms. On the one hand, it, it got fixed. Yeah. Uh, on, on the one hand, there is theory testing in realist evaluation, but we also acknowledge the social construction of our research. Um, and there's not this belief that, you know, you can go ahead with the theory testing and find the truth um, out there. Even though we do believe in a singular reality, that we are always socially, we're always constructing our knowledge. And so we, we borrow from both of those um, paradigms. And the retroduction, I have, a, I have a definition here. This is from the Sage Encyclopedia of Social Science Research Methods. Retroduction is meant to overcome the deficiencies of induction and deduction to offer causal explanation. Retroduction entails the idea of going back from below or behind observed patterns to discover what produces them. So I know that sometimes uh, we have to read things more than once to try to understand. It's not the most, not the easiest sentence, but what's key here is talks, this definition talks about observed patterns as opposed to the, the things that produce them. So it's the idea that, you know, if I'm, if I'm, you know, to look out from my perspective, what I see right now is I see, you know, a classroom and there are people sitting in chairs. So there's a, an observed reality that I can document. But what I don't know is I don't see there's an underlying reality that's happening here that is beyond my immediate view. And, for example, I mean, you didn't just come off the street. You're involved in institutional processes. Um, there's a reason why you, you, you've 
you've come here. And those kinds of underlying, um, under, um, underlying reality is what we're saying is that, has, that should have uh, validity in our research process. We, we don't undermine those more difficult to, um, to, to evidence uh, reality. And so that's what retroduction is. It's starting from the apparent reality and then going back to try to understand what is underpinning that reality. And so to really um, bring that point home, I'm going to use this metaphor of an iceberg. So in an iceberg, you can think of an iceberg as having two parts. One is the part that's above water, and then there's a part of the iceberg that is beneath the water. And you could say, this is just a metaphor, so at some point the metaphor does you know, break down, but just for our understanding about retroduction, you could say that the part of the iceberg um, above the water is like our evidence. It's what's clearly observable, what we can view, what we can measure, and then the part of the iceberg underneath the water is the hidden mechanism, which is much more difficult to observe and measure. And then here, um, the squiggly lines there are sort of like indicating the water around the iceberg. And those are the inactivated mechanisms. So these are the mechanisms that are dormant in our reality, which is quite an interesting concept if you think about it. Uh, this, this comes from critical realism. They talk about this idea of the ontology of absence. What, what doesn't exist in our reality is also part of our reality. Uh, it takes a while to <laughs> contemplate, but to bring it down to a really um, pragmatic example, you could say, for example, say if you were um, wanting to create an anti-smoking campaign and you wanted to reduce the number of people smoking on campus. You could say that there is a, a, a needed sort of desire or um, feeling that somebody has to have. Before they quit smoking, they need to feel that they want to quit smoking. And so you start from the assumption that that feeling is there as a potential in somebody. And that you create a certain environment or you Create, put an intervention into an environment that triggers that feeling. That if you can trigger that, that feeling inside of somebody to want to quit smoking, then presumably that may lead to the actual quitting of the smoking. And so we see that those, there's a latent potentiality there. And so if you approach um, research in that way, especially research around health improvement uh, and intervention research, then we, can, then, then, then we can start with the idea that it's all in, you know, in, in uh, people to make change and it's about creating the right atmosphere and the right um, intervention to do that. So, so now going back to the realist evaluation and synthesis process, so back to Pawson and Tilly's work. The process of undertaking a realist project is you start with your initial program theories. And you construct these theories using your background expertise, your retroductive thinking, um, and you can go to the literature. You can also consult stakeholders. Um, theories are not merely descriptive. Um, they paint a causal picture. So your, your, your theories, when, you're, when you start with your, your, your realist inquiry, you want to start with theories that are like candidate hypotheses about how you suspect a program is working. And then you use those theories to develop your research protocols and you gather evidence. So in a realist evaluation, you could use that theory to develop your interview guide or your focus group guide. Uh, in a synthesis, um, it would be to develop your identification, selection, and appraisal protocol for your, uh, for your realist synthesis. And, um, and then you gather evidence. Once you gather the evidence, you have data, then you configure your theory and your evidence together in what we call context mechanism outcome configurations, which I will explain in detail. And then you present the research output, which is context mechanism outcome configurations plus evidence informed theory. So the product of your review, this is what Ray Poss and Nick Tilly have said, is that your product of your review or your evaluation is refined theory. It's not facts per se, although you have evidence there, what you're saying at the end is 
these, uh, th this is the, the, the new informed, evidence-informed theory that can serve to guide the development of the, eval of the program in the future. But they are, the, the product is theoretical because of the belief that this theory needs to be tested again because uh, um, inevitably there will be new contexts in which the intervention is implemented and so these theories, do they hold in new contexts? They may not. So we're not, again, we're not talking about universally, you know, generalizable uh, facts and knowledge. We're, we're always talking about context-sensitive knowledge with the understanding that context is always changing and context changes from, uh, you know, site to site and time point to time point. Okay, is there any questions so far? So far, so good, hopefully. So, as I said, you start with your candidate program or middle range theories, and then you do this CMO configuration analysis, and at the end, you produce evidence-informed program or middle range theories. And let's just look at the CMO configuration. So this comes from Paulson and Tilly's uh, book, Realistic Evaluation, and it's basically um, depicting the CMO configuration in a diagram form. And it's saying that mechanisms have an impact, mechanisms produce outcomes, but they produce outcomes in context. So we always have to understand the interaction between the context and the mechanisms. And another way to say that is that mechanisms get triggered under the right contexts. So again, talking about those latent mechanisms, you could say that um, what you need to do is, is create the right environment for a mechanism to fire. That, that's sort of the language in, in, used in the Paulson and Tilly textbooks, that mechanisms fire. Since then, there's been you know, new thinking around you know, the metaphor about mechanisms getting triggered or fired because some people have said that, well, sometimes the mechanism is more gradual. It's not like an on-off switch. It's more like a dimmer switch. Um, and so there are different ways to think about um, the mechanism, but this is the general, uh, the, the general principle. Another way to think about it here is context plus mechanism equals outcome. That's another way that people have, have, have described it, and that's not necessarily a mathematical formula per se. It's more of a metaphor to say that there's always an interaction between the context and the mechanism and it's through that interaction that we can explain outcomes, that we can understand outcomes. And very, very basically, you can say that context is the environment. So when I say the environment, what I'm saying is anything in the backdrop of the program that is not formally part of the program, but could have an impact on the outcome. So um, it could be socio-demographic um, qualities, um, uh, geographic, political um, and pre-existing types of resources that don't have, that don't have a, uh, that are not directly part of the existing, the current program. And then the mechanism is defined as the resources offered by the program and the reaction to those resources by people, by stakeholders. And that could, that doesn't necessarily mean just end users, but it could also mean the deliverers of the program, so the frontline workers. It could also mean the policy architects of the program. So when you do a realist evaluation, you may want to interview a number of stakeholders along an implementation chain, for example. Um, but again, the mechanism is the resources and the reactions, and then the outcome is the effect. So the outcome can be process outcome, it can be the final outcome, um, depending on your analysis. Yes? I mean, um, you mentioned the environment there, and then the way you describe that, maybe some of people be quite complex, there's many aspects to what we call the environment. Yes. And um, this might also have some bearing on our interpretations of what's going on, which is the environment, so obviously affects how we see the mechanism maybe, and the process towards the effect. So, this, this is my question really, do, do we have to make some decisions about how we're going to boundary the environment and define the environment, and if so, how? How do we, in that kind of prior sense, without being, without prejudging on the process, how do we make that kind of decision about how to define our environment? Yeah, that's an excellent comment, and you've really um, identified, you know, some of the heart of the struggle 
in the realist approach. Because this is what people do find is, is maybe overwhelming, especially at first, because specifically because of this, the fact that the environment is just <coughs> massive, you know, and in, in, infinitely connected, you know, what, what, what we think of as the environment could, could mean so many different things. Um, and there's no hard and fast rule, and Paulson and Tilly don't delineate something that's really, you know, a very, very clear sort of um, locked down kind of protocol for assessing that. So this is where the interpretive process comes in, and this is where working in an interdisciplinary team of experts, um, either people who are like end users of a program or people who are policy architects in the program who really know the program and they know how it works, this is where that becomes very important because, yes, you do have to identify um, key elements of the environment, but there's no guarantee that you will capture it all or that you may... You, there's no guarantee that you will, you know, get it right in a sense. Um, and so that's not very reassuring, but what I say is that's more realistic. That when you apply your critical mind to it and you start brainstorming the possibilities of, the, of the, all the different ways in which the context could have an impact, and then you go out and you do some testing of that, you test that through the literature and through um, interviews with people, um, it becomes a very rich process, a very rich discussion, and it can be messy, um, but in the end, what you propose is, these are, these are your theories. If you create a very transparent process of how you got to those theories, um, then it's up to the scrutiny of the reader of your, of your research pro product to, to adjudicate and say, well, you, you, you may have missed something, but then the idea is that the, the, this knowledge is to accumulate over time. So what you've done in one study may not be the final, the final answer in terms of understanding the context. And so that's another take-home message. And what Paz and Tilly say too is that all knowledge is fallible, all knowledge is, is, is potentially faulty, and that in one realist project it's almost like you're just taking a slice of the pie. You're not actually, you know, eating the whole pie. You're just taking, you're just taking out one slice and putting that forward as, you know, the high your theories about how it's working based on evidence, you know, and it can be a very rigorous process of evidence um, generation. Uh, and maybe it, actually very, very useful, even though it seems a little bit precarious about how you got there, it might be very useful for the development of this program in, in the future. But let me see, I'll see if that helps when I give you an example. Here's another way of depicting the CMO configuration. It's the same thing. It's just sort of reminding us that uh, mechanisms happen at a different level of reality. If you think about the iceberg metaphor, it's like the idea that mechanisms are happening sort of below the surface, things that you can't quite see. Um, but we have to strive to understand these um, mechanisms, to understand outcomes. So, like I say, context can be, you know, um, cultural norms and values history in a, in, a, in a population or a community, economic financial conditions, geographic, socio-political elements, existing public policy or outcomes from previous stages of program implementation, anything in the physical environment that you see from your expertise um, that you have a, a, a sense about this is actually having an impact. And then mechanisms. So a mechanism can be described as that generative force that leads to outcomes, it really generates the outcome of interest. It's, it usually denotes the reasoning, so the cognitive or emotional reasoning of the various actors in response to resources offered. Uh, mechanisms are linked to, but are not synonymous with the program strategies, and as I've said, and they're triggered by the contextual factors. So that's a review of everything I've just said. And just going a bit further with mechanisms, this is a definition by Asbury and Liu uh, in a paper that they wrote on mechanisms for the social sciences. And they said mechanisms can be defined as underlying entities, processes, or structures which operate in particular contexts to generate outcomes of interest. Um, they are usually hidden. They are sensitive to variations, uh, variations in context, and they generate outcomes. And this, this, this is a most important statement, that for social interventions in the realist approach, we use mechanism to refer to the cognitive process 
or what turns on or not in the minds of the participants when they are offered or asked to engage in a program or intervention. So if you think about this idea of like, what, if, like, does, when people are given an intervention, you know, what, ter- what, does it turn them on to something, make them think a different way or make them feel engaged, make them feel motivated, make them feel enthusiastic, or does it make them feel nothing, or does it make them feel demotivated, does it make them feel upset or angry or, you know, exploited? You know, there's so many ways that people can feel after being offered a program. And again, this is not just um, the end user. This could be, say, for example, if you were to implement an intervention on a hospital ward with physiotherapists and nurses and doctors, all of those people also have their own reactions to, you know, their, uh, to the intervention and to the context. So um, their mechanisms, what's going on in their heads, are also playing a role in determining the success or the failure of a program. So that's really the heart of the realist approach. And the outcomes. Outcomes are intended or unintended, can be proximal, intermediate, or final. Um, And it it can encompass qualitative or quantitative data. And so examples could be improved health status, quality improvement efforts, increased uptake of a health service, uh, or enhanced research results. So really outcomes, we're really exploding this idea of outcomes to mean any impact or effect that um, an, an intervention has. Okay, so I'd like to um, exemplify mechanism, just to really see if we really understand what we're talking about here. So remember what I said, that the mechanism is this mix of the resource and the reasoning. So say, for example, we have an intervention. Um, and we, uh, the, the, the background is that we found that drunk driving amongst high school students in Region X, this is just a hypothetical example, I just made this up for the purpose of 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 this uh, understanding, in Region X was found to exceed the national average and a peer-to-peer intervention was implemented to discourage the activity. So uh, most of you know what that means, peer-to-peer intervention. Basically we would say train um, a group of students, say a group of grade 10 students, uh, and um, they would go through a little training and they would learn how to disseminate stories and information about the dangers of of drunk driving and then they would go to their classmates, their peers, and they would disseminate these stories and try to influence peers in a positive way. So here I have the mechanism as students who received the program became apprehensive and fearful after hearing stories of death and injury due to drunk driving. So does somebody want to take a guess as to what is the resource being offered in this particular example, what would you say is the resource being offered in the intervention? We have an idea. Yes. The stories. the stories. Thank you. That's exactly correct. The stories are the resource. So you understand when I said that the program strategy is not the same thing as the mechanism? Because the strategy is peer-to-peer. And if you were to go into a room where this is happening, you, on the on first glance, you say, okay, what's happening here is that there's a peer-to-peer interaction. But underneath that, what's actually happening is that there's a dissemination of, of stories. And what would be the reasoning? Somebody want to guess what the reasoning would be? Fear. Fear, okay. So in this particular example, and I've sort of given you clues because I underlined it, um, that the reaction, this could be emotional reaction or cognitive reaction, is uh, fear. So here we have a mechanism that encompasses both the resource being offered and the reaction to that resource, leading to an outcome. And here the outcome is a reduction of drunk driving incidents occurring six months following the program. Okay, I just, you know, hopefully that happens, but there's there's no guarantee that, that that would happen. But um, that's just to exemplify the mechanism and the outcome. So does that make sense? Anybody want to ask a question? Yes. <clears throat> Why can't we consider peer-to-peer as a resource? Because hearing stories from a teacher would have very different impact or results yes. as opposed to peer-to-peer. 
Right. That's, where would it fit? That's a, very, that's a very good point. I'll just repeat that. That Why can't we say that peer-to-peer -peer is the resource? Because if you hear the story from the teacher, that's a very different effect. But what you've just identified there is that there's more than one resource that peer-to-peer -peer offers. So what would you say is the resource that you just identified? Connectedness or, you know, connectedness. Exactly. Okay, good enough. I mean, I mean, if you did this research study, you'd have a lot of time to really think about the wording and you know, you'd go to the literature and you'd see all the different resources. But for the purposes of this moment, you could say connectedness. There's a, there's a difference when a peer gives a, a, a story to another peer, it might have a, more, a strong, presumably maybe a stronger impact because you know, they'd, they'd rather listen to their peer than the teacher. That's the theory behind it. Whether that works or not, who knows? Maybe some students would rather listen to their teacher than their peer. But that's the theory. So what we're saying in here is that there's more than one resource that peer-to-peer -peer strategy offers. One resource is the story. Another resource is the connection. Does anybody, could anybody else think of another resource that peer-to-peer -peer offers? Yes? Could be language, being able to communicate, or does that mean you can connectedness Well, it, it, yes, but you can unpack that connectedness idea. So you start with this idea of connectedness, but you, if you go even further, you could say talking about language. So you're saying that the, the, the discourse that, that the people of that age group speak will help to further instill the story as opposed to the, the teachers. So you see there, right away, we've already identified three potential mechanisms. Then what you do is those become your candidate theories, and then you go to the intervention. You, go, you could go to the literature, and you go to the interviews, and you ask people these. Like, do you think it's the connection? Do you think it's the language? Do you think it's the story? What, what about this program is working? So that's what we mean when we start with our theories and then we, we test those theories um, with all our different means of methods, means and methods of data collection. Okay? This is the mechanism. Now, now we're going to add context. Okay? So remember what I said about context. Background elements that contribute to the causal claim. So, again, same, same, same situation. We have drunk driving amongst high school students in Region X was found to exceed the national average. A peer-to-peer -peer interven intervention was implemented to discourage the activity. So say they, they did it in one locale, they say it really works, and now they've scaled it up across the country. So now in context one, the peer-to-peer -peer strategy was delivered in rural area, and one of the contexts about the rural area is that there's no nighttime public transport, there's no bus service uh, in, in that area. And so the mechanism here is that students still received the program, they still heard the stories, they still became fearful, but there was no change in the incidence of drunk driving because the context factor impeded the mechanism. Now in the second uh, example, the same peer-to-peer -peer strategy delivered in an urban area where there is available nighttime public transit. The mechanism, you know, still they received the program, they heard the stories, they became fearful, and there was a, a reduction. The mechanism worked. The mechanism and the context worked together. So in other words, the context was supportive of the intervention. Whereas here, you could say the context had barriers. And that's a very simplified example. You could probably think of many other elements of a rural context versus an urban context um, that might, might have an impact uh, on the outcome. But this is just to exemplify when I talk about the interaction between context and mechanism. So within the mechanism, there is resource and reasoning interaction. And then once you add context, there's another element there too. And so a lot of this has to be worked out through the... Yeah, you okay? Yeah. Yes? How do you... How, is the question is, is the context the same as factors? How do you define factors? Yeah, so, so if, if factors have to do with like socio-demographic issues and um, things like that, then yes. If the factor has to do with the actual program and what the program offers, then the factor is more like the mechanism. But if, if, if when you mean by factors, you're talking about environmental um, aspects, then yes, you could say that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, now there's another way that you can use the CMO configuration because this is a very open-ended kind of research approach and so you can use the CMO configuration in a way that suits your research needs. So here is an example, and this is how we used um, the CMO configuration in our publications, which is, are on these slides, and I'm happy to share these slides uh, you know, at the end. Um, but this is a time-sensitive analysis, where you have one CMO configuration, and then the outcome from the first phase or one phase of a program actually informs the context for a subsequent phase. So, um, in our paper, in, in our, paper, our 2015 paper, which the reference is at the end, we, de we developed this model here. We have an intervention, the intervention creates a CMO configuration, but there's actually a ripple effect. That doesn't, outcomes don't just happen immediately, but they happen through phases. And in the work we did with um, studying community academic collaborations, what we found is that um, collaborations that were very new, their early phases were really um, about efforts to build relationship, build trust amongst, part, about, amongst members. And so the early, part, early CMOs was, you know, the context had to do with like a lack of trust. The mechanism had to do with trust efforts, so like resources being offered from the academics to the community members that showed humility and showed that they are trustworthy. And the outcome was, you know, early research success, you know, maybe they worked on a very small project and they, they, it was successful. And through that uh, effort, the community felt that the academic members were genuinely interested in them and not just wanting to exploit them for their own academic agendas. Um, and then that outcome of trust would actually became a context in the subsequent phases. So like if I were to put that in a different kind of metaphor, say for example you had a garden and the soil is really rocky and really infertile and the intervention is like the gardening, like the effort you're making is the gardening. Before you can actually plant seeds and grow vegetables, you have to make the soil more fertile. So initial intervention efforts might just simply be making the context more fertile for the intervention to actually take, uh, take hold. And this is the challenge when you don't have a time-sensitive analysis. If you put an intervention into a context and you measure six months down the road if there's an impact, and at the apparent level, there's no impact. But what you may not be realizing is that there might be the sort of invisible mechanisms that are starting to get activated that don't really show results yet, but that will show results over time. So there's always a question about what is the right time, time point to do your evaluation to get results. Because sometimes if there is a, like, I mean, if you're working in, a, say, a migrant population or um, communities that are very disenfranchised or um, very deprived, materially deprived areas, an intervention might not show effects immediately. But even if the intervention failed, like, quote, unquote, failed, can we say that maybe there was some positive that came of, came of it that are, is not easily observable? And those are the kinds of questions that you can ask and you can theorize in a realist evaluation. So th this, was, um, this ca came from our work, uh, like I said. And uh, so this is a CMO um, trajectory that, that we um, adopted. And you can read about this in, in, in our publications um, that I've li I list at the end. So like I say, you know, context has to do with trust, pre-existing levels of trust and mechanisms was about feeling. So whenever you, you, you look at mechanisms, if the mechanism has to do with how people have felt or how people thought or felt, that's really much about the mechanism and the outcome <coughs> has to do with like those, you know, early research productivity, um, partnership growth and seeing how this moved um, along a time scale. And, uh, of course, th this is for partnerships that actually had, had success, and not, not every partnership does, so it kind of shows an ideal kind of model, but it could go, you know, it could go the other way as well. Um, but you, you're welcome to, to take a closer look at that in, in our publications. Um, so, 
Um, I just have a few more slides, actually, so we're coming up to the six-minute mark. So the possible goals, just to you know, wrap up the uh, presentation, possible goals of the evaluation or review. So the first one is to question program theory integrity. So the question is, is the underlying program theory sound? In other words, does it make sense to do this in this context? Does it, does it make sense to implement this intervention? Um, or to adjudicate between rival program theories. So the question is, what's really going on here? If this program is working, what is the theory that really holds, that really explains why this is working? Um, and so to do a realistic evaluation where you examine different theories, and, and you take those theories to your stakeholders, and you ask them to see, like, what do you think is, is really working here? Or to consider the same theory in comparative set settings. Does the assumption work under different cir circumstances? So these are all different ways that um, you, can, you can use a realist uh, evaluation. And uh, the diff there's also, like, in each di realist project, the emphasis can be different. So for one realist project, it can be really to clarify what's really going on in the program scenario because it's amazing when you start studying programs that um, quite often we don't really even know what's actually happening. So really to clarify what's really going on, to unearth the causal pathway leading to outcomes. So sometimes these outcomes are very complex and very difficult to understand and you can start to model a pathway, a causal pathway um, that has a long chain, as, as we did in, in our study. Uh, or to explore contextual determinants or to compare contexts. So as, you know, the question, does this, you know, does this program work as well in a resource-poor neighborhood as it does in a resource-rich um, neighborhood, for example? So it's like comparative, site A versus site B, for example. Or to theorize on the mechanisms because very hard to understand like what are the resources being produced um, and how people respond to those so your, your, your evaluation could actually the main goal of the evaluation is just to theorize those mechanisms and then to test them uh, or to define conceptualize and scope out the outcomes because sometimes we don't even <coughs> realize the extent of intended as well as unintended outcomes so to capture all of that the intended outcomes as well as unintended um, that could be the, uh, the focus. So just keep in mind that there's so many different ways in which you can uh, use, the, use the approach. And uh, here are um, publications coming from the work we did, um, the work that I, I, I contributed to from my postdoc. So in 2015, we published a paper um, that was a realist evaluation of the community-based participatory research where I did it interviews with academic and community um, partner partners. And we have a lot of interesting models in there. And the, the one before that is a reflection on using realist methodology for participatory research. So it's like a reflective paper. We really just reflected on our, our challenges. So that could be interesting. The third paper is our fi main findings paper from 2012 um, when we did our review and, and all the findings that we came to uh, uh, studying academic community partnerships. And the fourth paper is in 2011, um, this was our protocol paper where we, did, where we um, put out our protocol um, and our iteratively developed tools for identification, selection, and appraisal. And all this process I really talk about in great detail um, in my workshops about how you can develop your protocols for literature review, how you develop your interview guide, because there's a very specific way in which you develop your interview guide for a realist qualitative interview. And there's um, new article, uh, articles on um, realist qualitative interviews. The July 2016 edition of evaluation was a special edition of evaluation on realist evaluation that was co-edited by myself and Nick Tilly. And so there's uh, the, whole, the whole edition um, has articles on realist evaluation that you can read. One of those articles is on the realist qualitative interview. And um, that's sort of the end of my formal presentation. So we can now move to questions and discussion. 
Uh, but before that, I'll just, before I, I don't want to miss um, telling you that on the CARES website, if you haven't gone there already, there's a number of resources. In the resource section, there's um, a number of short videos by Ray Pawson where he, in just a sound bite, in seven minutes, ten minutes each, he describes um, principles of realist uh, methodology. Also on the CARES website are the video plenary speakers from our 2016 conference as well as our 2014 conference. So there's eight presentations there, including Ray Pawson, Nick Tilly, Trish Greenhalgh, um, Joe Rycroft Malone, who is um, head of uh, health services and delivery research at NIHR, and she's you know, very much part of the realist uh, um, community. And so there's a lot of resources on there and some interesting conversations through those, through those talks that you're welcome to view. And uh, the other thing is, if you're interested in, in being more involved with the realist community, there's an online um, email discussion group that's about 750 people, and including all the experts, Ray Pawson and Trish Greenhouse and um, many others. It's a very supportive group, and many people write in with their questions. PhD students write in and professionals with their specific questions, and they get a lot of um, feedback and response. So if you are interested in joining that group, you have to contact Jeff Wong, but you can email me, and then I can, I can um, give you instructions on how you can uh, get, get linked up to that, to that online forum. So those are some resources, and so now we can have a conversation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um,